Well, everyone in the house is saying hi to each other. I want to welcome everyone joining us on our app or website. Thanks for hanging out with us. Let us know where you're watching from. We want you to know that we are for you no matter where you may be viewing this right now. We're glad you are here. Glad you guys are here this morning, too. As Paul mentioned just a, a second ago, we are celebrating baptism today. So if something moves inside you today and you feel like, man, today's the day I need to get baptized, but you didn't bring a change of clothes, guess what? We got you. We got you. We got a change of clothes and a towel out there. So don't let anything stand in the way if you feel like it's today is the day that you need to go forward and go public with your faith. Well, a couple weeks ago, my oldest daughter, Sophie, had a chorus competition in Ocala. These were individual competitions where she would be graded. It was a, a pretty stressful time. She'd never actually done this solo before. So we, we head out to Ocala. It was going to take about an hour and a half to get there <laughs> on a good day, right? It was going to take about an hour and a half to get there. She had to get there an hour before the performance. We hadn't eaten yet, so we gave ourselves five hours of leeway, okay? We, we thought five hours is plenty of time, amen? Right, like, like, like five, you know, hour and a half, hour eating. So we, we thought we were golden, okay? So we leave the house and realizing that traffic on 54, God help us. Like seriously, we need to, to have like a deliverance over that road or, or, or something. But yeah, it's like 19 junior. It's, it's, it's crazy. So, so we, we know that the, the 54 is going to be nuts. So we actually headed north on the parkway to hop on like 52 or some other road to, to head over to the interstate. So we get on 52. We get about a mile from Aaron Cutoff. And I see the temperature gauge on Cheryl's car is pegged. And I'm like, this is not good. So I pull over on the side of the road. I pop the hood and discovered that the radiator cap was not there. Most of the fluid inside had boiled out. You don't have to know much about cars to know that's not good. So in a MacGyver moment, okay, long story short, MacGyver moment, all right, MacGyver moment, I went and got all of the water we had in the car. Thank God for trash can-sized Stanley cups today, amen? Come on, someone. Like, you're rocking the Stanley today. Woo! How many of y'all rocking the Stanley? Anybody out there rocking the Stanley? Yeah, okay, there you are, there you are. So, you know, we've got like the 64 ounce, you know, so, so we, we took all the water that we had in the car, our drinking water, I poured it in there, and then y'all, I duct taped, I duct taped the radiator shut, and we tried to limp, we actually, yeah, we, we limped the car back home, we got in my truck, did the whole thing over again, barely got there, just in time, and on top of that, and a sinus infection, my baby girl still got a straight superior on her, her, uh, her performance, I'm bragging on her. But after we had kind of eaten, well, eaten, that's, that's great English there. After we had already eat, I'm still saying it. After we already ate, good Lord, what's wrong with me? I am a hick and I can't help it. So, so after we ate something uh, and decompressed a little bit, I finally realized what had happened. A few weeks before this, we had had Cheryl's car serviced. And her radiator cap is one of the ones that you don't just tighten it, but you have to tighten it until it does what it some of you have a gas cap like this, right? It's, you, you twist it until it clicks, and when it clicks, you know that's when it's on. What had happened is this technician obviously had some unfinished business. And his unfinished business, it didn't happen right away, but eventually what's true of unfinished business is this, is that unfinished business in the past never does what? It never remains in the past. For us, it took a few weeks before it bit us, but it always comes back. This is true for unfinished business under the hood of your car, but it's also true for your soul and my soul. Amen? That when you've got some unfinished business in there, it's, it's going to come back up at, at some point. And so for a couple weeks here, I just felt led that the, the direction that God was leading us was to stop and to pause as we, we kind of enter into this Easter season, was to, to, to do some some inventory of the unfinished business that we have in our lives. And so this week, next week, and we might even add a third week to it, we're going to be talking about this. And today I want to preach a message I'm calling Getting to the Root. Turn to someone next to you and say, we're going to get to the root today. And I don't mean like a root canal. That's a whole other level of pain. That's different pain. Of, of all the wounds that we gain in life, the ones gained in childhood tend to be the heaviest. Would you guys agree with that? The, the, the wounds that are gained when we are little people and we have big people tell us things or say things or do things to us, those are wounds that we, we believe as true and we live those out into the remainder of our life. As a parent now for the past 12 years, I've learned that kids are the world's best recorders, but the absolute worst at interpretation, amen? 
They're great at recording things, but lousy at interpreting that later, later on. And what I mean by that is when you're a little person and a big person, whether it be a parent or a coach or a teacher or a pastor, when someone bigger than you, when you're a little person, tells you something, what do you do? You believe that. And, and the things that we believe, we then internalize those things as we're little, and we live the rest of our lives many times trying to compensate for those things. Dr. Charles Cooley, uh, he says this. He says, our self-esteem is largely determined by what you think the person who matters most to you thinks about you. Let me say that again to make sure you follow that. Our self-esteem, it's based by what you think the person who matters most to you. So think of whoever matters most to you in your life. Your self-esteem is determined by what you think they think about you. In other words, when you're little, these things get etched into our souls. And they're believed as truth. Whether they're truth or not, we believe them, we receive them as truth, and then we live them out the rest of our lives. And many of us today are still compensating for the things that were done to us or spoken to us when we were just little. Some of you today, you're the type of people that you just like lash out at other people, it seems, for no reason. And the reason that you lose your top and, 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 and lash out at people, it's got nothing to do with them, but it, it's, it's something that they touched on. They, they hit a nerve, right? They, they, they touched on some of that pain from the past, and so you take it out on them. Others of us, we, we tend to just numb ourselves from this. We use alcohol, drugs, promiscuity. We, we use that to try to numb these things from the past. Maybe you become a highly controlling person. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you know someone like that, but if you know someone who is a highly controlling person, chances are there's a woundedness in their past they're trying to compensate for. Uh, other people, they turn to uh, being a people pleaser. Some people turn to self-harm. Some people use it as the fuel to, to work too much and to try to achieve a level of success they think is going to soothe their souls, but it never does. The, the wounds that we received in childhood, in those early formative years of our life, they become the lens through which we view the rest of our lives. We call these things coping mechanisms. You've heard that term before, right? Coping mechanisms. Coping mechanisms are what you did as a kid to survive. Coping mechanisms are the things that you did, you, you got through it as best you knew how to deal with a dysfunctional family. I mean, your family put the fun in dysfunctional, right? Like, like... You, you learned as best you could to deal with a dysfunctional family or to deal with a painful past. And so you develop these coping mechanisms. But the thing that I want you to see today is that something that you did as a child to help you cope does not serve you well as an adult. In fact, the only thing that these coping mechanisms do as an adult is they keep you shackled to that little boy or that little girl that got hurt. By continuing to use these things, all you're simply doing is diving deeper and deeper into your pain, not setting yourself free from it. This is the problem with stuffing our hurts down, down deep and trying to ignore that it happened or pretend to just make it go away. The, the, the problem with stuffing all that stuff is that eventually it's going to come back out. And someone is going to bump into us or do something. It's going to remind us of that pain. They're going to say something, and we're just going to, like, word vomit all over them. You, you've been there before, right? The, all someone said was, do you want Chipotle or Modes? And they're like, ah! I was like, where did that come from? I don't know. Well, it came from your unfinished business. That's where those, where those things come from. It, 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 someone reminds you of that pain from the past that you stuffed down, and we, we, we lose control over it, and it comes out in a wrong way with the wrong people at the wrong time, and it's always disproportionate to the moment. Your reaction is always disproportionate to whatever was going on. And what happens is we end up wounding the people we love the most with the same wounding that we experienced as a kid. Does that sound remotely familiar to anyone's experience today? No one wants to admit that, right? Yeah, yeah, put your, yeah, yeah, put your hands in there. Be, be proud of that. Like, yeah, that's me, okay? I'm a little messed up. We're all a little messed up. We all have our unfinished business. It's kind of like guacamole. Guacamole, it's tasty in the moment, but it don't keep. In the moment, it feels good. In the moment, it seems right, but stuffed down, suppressed anger, it does not keep well. A hundred years ago, industrialists thought they could take toxic waste and just bury it in the ground and be done with it. But what did we learn? It leaks, it seeps, and it ruins the environment. Stuffed anger and pain in your life, it does the same thing. It will ruin your emotional 
ecosystem. But hear me, church, those triggers that you have, those things that someone says or someone does and it triggers you, those original hurts, those things that were said to you that you've tried to oppress from way back when, those are the very things that I believe today God wants to set you free from. Do you believe that? I believe that he wants to to set you free from those things in your past. So whether the pain happened a long time ago or whether the pain was recent, I want to address this thing that we do as human beings of stuffing it down, of suppressing it, or what the Bible simply calls bitterness. Everyone say bitterness because that's exactly what it leads to. So if you have a Bible today or the Bible app on your phone, grab it. We're going to be again in the book of Hebrews We're not exactly sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some people believe it was the Apostle Paul. Others believe it was somebody else. But the the author of Hebrews, he gives us this command. They say, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. And that no what? Oh, come on, help me out, church. No what? No. Bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. In this passage, bitterness is described as a root. And what do we know about roots? Roots are always under the ground. Roots remain dormant oftentimes for a long period of time. Roots are buried. Roots are down deep. But what happens to a root is a root eventually breaks through the surface and becomes fruit. Roots always turn into fruit. Roots always turn into fruit. And the things that you stuffed down and you thought you buried in your past, they're going to have a way of coming and manifesting themselves in your life at some point. And it's always going to be when you least expect it, when you don't want it, and it's going to be disproportional to whatever the situation is. So, so let's talk about why it's so difficult to unroot these things. Like if, if bitterness is a root that gets down there and the instruction of Scripture is to, hey, let's, let, let, let's get, the, get the root out, why is that such a difficult thing to do. Scripture has a lot to say about how to deal with a painful past, but denialism is not one of those. So how do we how do we unroot these things? Why is it so difficult? Well, the first reason I put my notes of why it's so difficult is because bitterness hides behind outward conformity. And what I mean by outward conformity is we all know once we get into our adult years how to wear a mask. We all know how to masquerade around as everything is fine. How you doing? Fine. Great. This is the mask you wear when you come to church on Sundays. Hi. How you doing? Yes. Hold my hand, baby. We're, we're fine. Hi. Right. You guys just got in a massive fight in the car, but you're fine. Right. You just called your kids a four-letter word, but you're, you're fine. Right. We, we, when we get to adulthood, we know how to masquerade around, and what happens is bitterness hides behind that. Uh, one of the, the best examples that I could think of in Scripture is a guy in the Old Testament by the name of Ahithophel. Everyone say Ahithophel. If you're looking for a baby name, that might be your one right there. Ahithophel. When we first are introduced to Ahithophel in the Old Testament, he's actually engaged in an act of worship. We also learned about Ahithophel that he gave really great advice. In fact, the advice that Ahithophel gave is pretty amazing. Scripture says this. It says, now in those days, the advice of Ahithophel, the advice that he gave, it was like one who inquired of God. In other words, if you wanted to get some advice straight from God, go to Ahithophel, right? Because Ahithophel, talking to him, was just like getting it straight from God. That's pretty high praise. No one's ever said that about me in my messages. No one. Like, like pastor was like getting it straight from the mouth of God. And no one's ever said that. But for Ahithophel, the words that he gave was like getting it straight from God. So he's obviously, he gives good advice. He was a wise counselor. He was actually a friend to King David. But there was something hidden beneath the surface of Ahithophel's life. Even though we see him engaging in worship and being a wise counselor and getting these words from God, there was a deep root of bitterness that was growing beneath the surface. That, that something had happened in his past that he was nursing and it was doing its work. He actually had bitterness and resentment towards King David. And this bitterness, even though on the outside it seemed like he was fine and seemed like he was a man of God, this bitterness did what bitterness does, and it was beginning to eat him away from the, from the inside out. This is why bitterness is so hard to detect is because it can lie dormant for years. In Ahithophel's case, it lied dormant for nine years. Between the offense and when things kind of came to a head, nine years he let this just kind of kind of slow burn. That's what happens. Is, is we have the initial offense and, and, and we stuff it down and we bury it and we just rehearse it over and over again in our mind for weeks or months or even years. But then eventually it comes out, as we talked about. 
And eventually, we just erupt on someone. And instead of dealing with things in the moment, we just let it all out on them. Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? You ever done that? Doesn't it feel good sometimes, right? You just let it all out, and you just lay into them, and you give an entire list of why they're a terrible human being. And we do that to control the situation and to appear righteous in our own eyes. So we let it all out. It's going to happen for nine, for nine years later for Ahithophel is when it finally happened. The, the, the day that he finally lets it out, that he lets it manifest, is when David's son Absalom, all name team going on here, right? When It gets better. When, when Absalom, his son, David's son, actually tried to take over the kingdom. He ran his dad out. He was going to take over, and Ahithophel thought, David is vulnerable in this moment. I'm going to kick him while he's down. He saw red. He saw the red mist. He's like, I'm, I'm going to go after it. And so he joins the rebellion against King David, and he gets with Absalom. And because Ahithophel gave such wise advice, he gives him two pieces of wise counsel. The first piece of wise counsel, go sleep with all your dad's concubines and wives. That was his first piece of advice. You know what Absalom did? He went and slept with his dad's concubines and wives, and that defilement put a rift between father and son that was never healed. The second wise advice that Ahithophel gave to Absalom was, hey, why don't you go kill your dad, and then you can take the kingdom, and it will be yours. Now, fortunately, Absalom didn't follow through on this because he probably would have been successful in David in his weakened state. But David had a true friend in Absalom's court. See, within Absalom's court, there was a guy named Hushai. I told you they'd get better. There was a guy named Hushai, and Hushai was loyal to King David, and he was going to flee with King David when all this turmoil began to go on and this rebellion took place. But David's like, no, I want you to stay behind, and I want you to kind of be a covert, you know, undercover spy, and I want you to report back on what's going on. So Hushai stays behind, and eventually he gains favor with Absalom and talks Absalom out of trying to kill his father. Well, Ahithophel, when he realizes that his plan is not going to happen and all this deceit and lies and all the things that he's been doing behind the scenes, that's going to come to light. He goes home and commits suicide, which is a reminder of where bitterness leads. If not dealt with, it will destroy you. But I haven't told you yet why Ahithophel was so mad at David in the first place. You ready for this? See, Ahithophel had a granddaughter. Her name was Bathsheba. And if you remember what happened, Bathsheba is the young woman that David cheated on his wife with, and he found her, he brought her in, and he disgraced her, and he got her pregnant, and then he had her husband killed. If I'm Ahithophel, I'm upset too, amen? I've got it in for this guy too. I can fully understand that. But the the bitterness and holding on to everything that he held on to, the slow burn for nine years, that was a decision that Ahithophel made, and it was his decision alone. There were other options. Ahithophel could have gone to David and confronted him and said, listen, you treated my granddaughter as a plaything. We're going to have words. He could have confronted him. But no, he cowered, and he hid behind his pain. He he could have chosen to forgive David, but he didn't. For nine years, he let it fester, and what happened? David was not the one that was destroyed, who ultimately was the one that was destroyed. It was Ahithophel, wasn't it? And that reminds me of the second reason why it's so difficult to unroot this stuff. is because bitterness wears a self-righteous mask. Bitterness wears a self-righteous mask. One of the reasons that we like to to paint a picture of people as being all bad and they're terrible and they did this to me. We try try to paint people as being this horrible person because if we can paint this person as a horrible person because of what they did to us, then it makes us feel self-righteous about how we're slandering their name, about how we're gossiping them, about how we're rooting for their demise how we're constantly looking for for different things to add to our ammunition and layer after layer of bitterness mounts. You you, you can always tell a person who's wrestling with bitterness because when they're finally confronted about their bitterness towards the person that hurt them, they get defensive. And they say things like, well, you don't know what happened. And you don't know what they did to me. What is that? It's a self-righteous mask. I have the right to hold on to this. I have the right to feel this way. I have the right to hold on to this hurt. The Bible addresses this, though. In the book of James, it says this. It says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not what? 
don't boast about it or deny the truth. James is, is saying the same exact thing. Don't brag about your moral superiority and how moral you are and, and how righteous you are if you're harboring bitterness in your heart. He says, it, 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 don't do that. It, it, bitterness likes to wear religious clothing. Uh, bitterness likes to sound spiritual because it justifies the hatred that we hold on to in our hearts. Which leads me to this. I put this in my notes. Is that bitterness is a choice, ultimately. Bitterness is a choice. Ahithophel had a choice. Bitterness is a choice. Now, what's interesting is if you go through the Old Testament, and I know this is something that all of you guys do. I know you do this, but, but if you go through the Old Testament and learn the word that we translate as bitterness into English, you learn it's the word marar. Marar. It sounds like rar. I don't know. Marar. But this word in the Old Testament that we translate into English as bitterness, it has two meanings. One meaning can be something that tastes bitter or something that happens inside of a human heart. That can be one translation. The other translation of the same word is it's something that makes you stronger. And now at first glance, you're like, how could the same word mean those two very different things? Those are two wildly different things. One is like this bitterness and nasty thing that you feel inside you towards someone else. And one is something that makes you stronger. Here, here's why. It's because hurt and pain can lead to either outcome. It can lead to bitterness and hurt and resentment, or it can lead to you being better. It can make you bitter, or it can make you better. We see this played out in the story of God's people. In Exodus chapter 1, it says this. It says, they, meaning the Egyptians, they made their, meaning the Hebrews, in slavery, their lives what? Their lives were what? They were bitter. There's our word. Rawr. Forcing them to mix mortar and to make bricks and to do all the work in the fields. And this verse is talking about how the, the Jews were treated in Egypt. They were oppressed. They were made to do all this manual labor. They had to build, like, people, like who built the pyramids? The Jews did, okay? It wasn't, it wasn't the aliens. It was the Jews. They, they, they were forced to, to do all of Pharaoh's projects. And, and, and one translation could be that that made them bitter, and that would be a proper translation of the word. But there are a group of Old Testament scholars that believe this also could be translated as it made them stronger. In other words, the things that Pharaoh tried to do to break them, the things that he tried to do to make them bitter, that actually made them stronger or it made them better from all of that manual labor, amen? And so what Pharaoh eventually began to fear wasn't a group of bitter people. No, he feared a group of strong people, right? And so the choice of which happens to you and to me, bitter or better, it's really our choice. It's up to you and it's up to me. Th think about the implications of this. We like to blame the other person that did this thing to us for our bitterness. The reason I'm so bitter is because of what they did to me. But here's the reality uh, of this. The, the truth is that bitterness is always a self-imposed prison. No one can make you bitter. You make yourself bitter. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Turn to someone next to you and say, aren't you glad you came to church today? But that's the truth. It's that no one can make you bitter. It's a choice that you make. It's a wrong reaction to a perceived injustice. And you have the choice, am I going to allow this to make me bitter? Or am I going to allow this to make me, make me, me better? So, so shift gears here. Let's talk about the consequences for bitterness. I, I think we can all see why it's so difficult. And, and you can probably think of some consequences like sleeplessness, ulcers, irritability, angry words, ruined marriages, separated families, a lot of other terrible things. So, so what are some of the blowbacks? What are some of the, the things that happen when we allow that bitter root to take, to take home in our, in our hearts? The first thing that I came up with is this, is that it'll dominate you mentally. If you allow bitterness to take root in your life, it'll dominate you mentally. There is a law of life that if you allow something ugly inside of you, it's going to remain ugly inside of you. The ugly thing that you allow in is only going to get uglier. The Bible tells us that we're only hurting ourselves, that, that holding on to bitterness is just self-induced misery. Notice in, in Hebrews 12, verse 15, it says again, it says, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, trouble you, trouble you. Turn to someone next to you and say, trouble you. Who does bitterness trouble? Who does bitterness trouble? Yeah, it, 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 it troubles you. Bitterness is, is, it does more harm to the vessel that it is stored than on the one that it is poured. But if we continue to 
to rehearse all of these, these negative thoughts and negative feelings towards this person, eventually we become a, 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 a prisoner of our own making. We become a prisoner. We're the ones that are in prison because of our own choice. And listen, it is easy. It is easy to feel, to feel righteously obsessed with the thing that happened to us. And, and they did this, and this hurt me, and this is what it happened in my life, and this, this, and this, and this is what they took from me. And listen, it, it feels good to rehearse those things over and over. It, 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 there is something that is almost intoxicating about that because you feel like I am so much better than this person that hurt me. It, there is something that feels good about that, 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 that you keep thinking about how they hurt you and what they took away and how it's harmed you. And, and man, I'm, I'm such a better person than them, and they're scum. And, and, and what God's been teaching me in my own heart is if I continue to rehearse the injury over and over again and the things that happened, that's an indicator that there's something broken in me. There may have been something broken in them to do this to me, but there's something broken inside of me that needs my needs my attention because it'll dominate you mentally when you allow it to take root. I also put this in mind. Says, bitterness remembers details. Bitterness remembers details. You've had thousands of conversations in your life and remember hardly any of them. But there's one conversation that took place five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and you can remember not just what they said, but the way that they said it, the look in their eye, the inflection in their voice, amen? Like, you remember everything about that one conversation that happened. And you're like, well, 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 Pastor Brian's because I have a great memory. Maybe, but doubtful. Because here's what's the thing about memory. Memory gets better when you rehearse something, amen? And so the reason that you remembered that situation so well is because you've rehearsed it so well so many times. And when you notice that about yourself, that you're rehearsing this thing over and over and over again, it's an indication that you have not dealt with that experience properly. Or what's worse about it is this, is that the undisposed past creates a filter by which we misinterpret life. I heard someone say this one time, that when I become an emotional garbage collector, it won't be long before everything in my life begins to stink. Garbage becomes the filter that we filter life through. I also put this in my notes, is that bitterness will depress you emotionally. Bitterness will depress you emotionally. Bitter people are not happy people. Period. In a sentence. You, you will never meet a bitter person that's happy. Cynicism, pessimism, criticism, negativism, these are all marks of a bitter person. I came across this, this quote too and thought it was too good. Unforgiveness is choosing to stay trapped in a jail cell of bitterness, serving time for someone else's crime. You're the one that pays the price. It depresses you emotionally. Third consequence of bitterness is this. It will debilitate you physically. It will debilitate you physically. Dr. Redford Williams of Duke University Medical Center, he says this. People who harbor hostility and anger are five times more likely to die of heart disease and six times more likely to die premature deaths from some other cause. The University of Tennessee completed a study of women in anger. Not why it was, not sure why it was women in anger. I don't know. I'm just, that was the study. <laughs> don't throw things at me. But, but in this study of women in anger, they discovered this, that many health problems like depression, headaches, obesity, and autoimmune diseases are a direct result from allowing unresolved anger to fester. Now, I'm not saying that every sick person is a bitter person or that every bitter person is a sick person, but every bitter person that does not deal with their bitterness will pay the price physically. It's going to affect you physically. Uh, the fourth consequence of bitterness is this. It will drain you relationally. It will drain you relationally. It will dominate you mentally. It will depress you emotionally. It will debilitate you physically. It will drain you relationally. Look at how Deuteronomy describes this. God says this. He says, I, I am making this covenant with you so that you... I can't read with my glasses on. I am making this covenant with you so that no one among you, no man, woman, clan, or tribe, pay attention, man, woman, clan, or tribe, will turn away from the Lord our God to worship these gods of other nations, and so that no root among you bears bitter and poisonous fruit. That passage describes a progression, man, wife, family, tribe, man, wife, family, tribe. That's what bitterness does. Bitterness goes throughout our relational circles. Bitterness doesn't just remain with, with you. Bitterness, once we're injured, it seeks reinforcement. In other words, bitterness never suffers alone. Whenever you have someone that's bitter, they're always looking for someone to reinforce the way that they feel. And so if you find yourself telling all these people in your life about what happened to you, and these people had nothing to do with what happened to you, that's an indication that all you're simply doing is seeking sympathy. 
And if that's your goal is just simply to seek sympathy, the bitterness that you possess, it's not just going to infect you and keep you in a prison. It's going to infect them and going to keep them in a prison as well, because bitterness doesn't remain with you. It infects everyone in your relational circle. It goes from man, wife, family and tribe. It, it expands. And the final consequence of bitterness and maybe the most devastating is this is it'll damage you spiritually. It'll damage you spiritually. When I hang on to bitterness, I, I grieve the heart of God. The Apostle Paul, he put it this way. He warns the Ephesian church and says this. He says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Now, let's be honest. When we get hurt, we get so caught up in the pain and the hurt that we feel that we don't even consider that somehow we're hurting God in the process. That when we hold on to that hurt and refuse to let go of that hurt, that we're actually hurting the heart of God, which should be reason enough to let go of bitterness. But what Scripture actually says is the reason that it hurts God is because we're giving the devil a foothold in our life. That when you nurse that grudge and hold on to that bitterness from that pain, that you're giving the devil a foothold and that grieves the heart of God. So again, all kind of stuff we could talk about. I think you get the idea, hey, bitterness, it ain't good. (laughs) Right. We get the idea. We shouldn't let this take root in our lives. So let's talk about solutions and then we'll get on with the service today. So here's some solutions I want to give you. Write these three phrases down. Trace it, face it and erase it. Trace it, face it and erase it. Say that with me. Trace it, face it and erase it. What are we going to do? We're going to trace it, face it and erase it. I'll try to go through these fast. First is to trace it, to trace it. Your surest sign of unfinished business in your heart is your reactions. If you're having bigger reactions than the moment warrants, that's an indicator of where your unfinished business may lie. That you're rolling this present moment and the events in this present moment, you're rolling this pain into previous pain. You're taking current anger and rolling it into your previous anger. It's the right anger, but the wrong battlefield. And you keep stacking this on top of each other. So if you pay attention to your reactions, you can, you can trace where the root of your hurt actually lies. Because let's be honest about this. Our relationships, your wife, your husband, your kids, neighbors, friends at work, those relationships have enough difficulty as they are. Amen. <laughs> the last thing you need in those relationships is to be bringing the hurt from your dad or mom into those The last thing you need to do is to bring the hurt you had as a young person into those relationships today. So when you find yourself getting reactive, slow down and begin to ask yourself some questions. Questions like this. Why is this making me so mad? When have other people hurt you in the same way? What are the lies and distortions that you've believed? Where do you feel vulnerable right now? Ask yourself, where is the real hurt that you're experiencing? Why is this so sensitive? What distorted or harmful message from the past is now being reinforced in my present. What am I actually fearing in this moment? Am I fearing that I'm unlovable? Am I fearing that I'm not acceptable? Am I fearing there's something actually fundamentally flawed about me? Your blow-ups and your breakdowns, those are the keys to finding the root of your hurt. And if you will trace those down, if you will follow the, the reactions and where that leads you to, here's what I believe, that that will be the key to your freedom. I believe that God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, wants to use your reactions and to allow you to trace those back to the roots so that you can find the freedom that you desire, so that you're not continuing to have these reactions over and over again, so that you can get rid of the triggers that you feel in your life, so that you won't continue to hurt people with hurt that has nothing to do with them. Doesn't that sound better? To be freed from that? So you trace it back down to the root. You follow your reactions and where they, where they lead you. So you trace it, and then the second thing is this. You have to face it. You have to face it. And, and I want to warn you, when you face it, it's going to hurt. <laughs> the reason we don't like to go back and revisit the past is because we know it, that it hurt the first time, and it's going to hurt if we revisit it the second time. But consider the alternative. Consider the alternative to not dealing with the stuff in our past. We continue to be someone who's easily triggered. Who wants to be someone that's easily triggered? Who wants to be that guy? Who wants to be the person that this people know how to push your buttons? Who wants to be the kind of person that continues to hurt the people around them with the same hurt that they have experienced? So let's consider the alternative. You could go back and revisit it. You could grieve that this happened to you. You could look at it with adult eyes, and you could choose to forgive, and you could unshackle yourself from your past once and for all. That you can trace it. You can, you can then face it. 
Let me, let me tell you why this is so important. Because when you go through Pandora's box and begin to go through and look at all the things from your past, yes, there's pain involved in that, but you get to go with adult eyes and say, you know what, that's not me, and, and, and that's not me either. And I didn't do that to myself, and I didn't deserve to have that done to me, and I, I don't need to carry this anymore, amen? That you're able to go back and look at those things and free yourself, even though it's painful, you can, you can be set free. And, and, and the good news, if you don't have to do this alone, this promise from Scripture in Psalm 34, God says this, if your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. If you're kicked in the gut, he'll help you catch your breath. The great devotional writer Oswald Chambers, he wrote this, leave the broken, irreversible past in God's hands and step out into the invincible future with him. As you examine the garbage in your life, pray this prayer. Say, God, help me to see myself the way that you see me. For so long, I've carried this stuff with me and I've made this a part of my identity. God, help me to see myself the way that you see me. Help me to see me the way that you see me. I go back to the beginning of the message when I talked about Dr. Cooley, and he said that self-esteem is largely determined by what you think the most important person in your life thinks about you. So if that's true, once you've examined what the important people in your life have said about you as a child, then what you realize is that God's opinion of you weighs a whole lot more than mommy and daddy's opinion of you. It weighs a whole lot more than that teacher or that coach's opinion of you. His opinion matters the most. Well, what, what's God's opinion about you? What does God think about you? I'll tell you this. The one who knows you the best loves you the most. You should write that down somewhere. You should personalize that. You should put that somewhere in your house. Is that the one who knows you the best actually loves you the most? Final step, erase it. You trace it, you face it, and then you erase it. This is the power, the power of forgiveness. And listen to me, forgiveness is not trying to make excuses for what they did. It's not trying to come up with, with like, well, this is why they did this and trying to understand why they did it and somehow that makes it easier. No, no, forgiveness is just, you know what? It's acknowledging that that was wrong and that was evil, period, end of sentence. You don't have to try to understand it. So, so many times we, we get caught up in psychoanalyzing people. Like if I could understand why this person did this and make all these excuses for why they did it because of what happened to them, then I could understand it better and I could forgive them. Listen to me. If all you're trying to do is understand why someone hurts you, you're probably not doing the more important work of forgiveness. Understanding why someone hurts you is not forgiveness. For, forgiveness is calling sin a sin. It's saying, yes, that was evil. That was wrong. End of sentence. Full stop. Uh, forgiveness is saying this forgiveness is saying i don't see the need for you to be involved in my pain any longer there's no reason for you to be involved in my pain any longer it's making you the hero in the story that you tell and not the victim it's giving your future power not your past the power and i realize some of you right now may not feel like forgiving you may not feel like forgiving that person that did that you're like thanks brian for the message but i'm not doing that here's my suggestion to you would you pray and ask God to give you the strength to do it anyway, whether you feel like it or not? Ask God to begin to reveal to you the damage that it's doing inside your heart. Ask God to help you unshackle yourself from your past. Ask God to help you keep short accounts with people. Better to deal with something, a little bit of pain in the moment than to have something that becomes a perpetual problem in your life. And so here's what I've been praying for each of you whether you feel like forgiving or not, that the Holy Spirit would begin to convict you in this moment. No matter when you're watching this, that the Holy Spirit would begin to work inside your heart and to begin to reveal to you the unfinished business that's inside of you. Your blow-ups and your breakdowns, they're, they're on the front lines telling you that your past is interfering with your present, but it doesn't have to be that way. My prayer has been that today that you would begin the first step of making your past your past. Of tracing where those wounds came from. Of facing those things and dealing with those things so that you could begin to experience the freedom that our Lord and Savior died on the cross for 2,000 years ago. Let me pray for you guys. Father, I pray right now for those of, those of us in this room that this message hits way too close to home and we know where the unfinished business is and it's right there and it hurts and it's bubbling up and we can feel it right now and even hearing this message has made us uncomfortable God I pray that you would come and you would bring clarity in this moment 
that we would have the courage to trace it back down to the root, that we would have the courage to face it and then to erase it. Erase it because that's what you did for us. You came and you bled and you died. You sent your son to die for our sins, to erase everything we had ever done, everything that we would do. God, you gave us a before and after. And so I pray that in this moment, that this becomes the before and after moment in our lives with this root of bitterness. That there was a before, there's this moment, and there's going to be an after. I pray for the courage to deal with these things, to set us free from these things. If there's anyone in the house today that has not said yes to this Jesus, the one that came to forgive us 2,000 years ago, pray that you say yes to him in this moment. You say yes to his love, his forgiveness. That the reason he came is to free us from the past and unshackle us from the hurt that was done to us. To give us a glorious future, a, a future of freedom. If you've never said yes to that invitation, then I pray you say yes right now. And here's what's so cool. If you said yes to that today, there's some people that that have already said yes to Jesus and they're going to get baptized here in just a moment. Baptism is simply an outward reflection of an inward connection. It's showing everyone on the outside the beautiful things that you've begun to do on the inside of us as we accepted your forgiveness and you began to come in and to show us the broken places and to bring healing and to show us freedom and to give us new life. Baptism is showing the world this beautiful thing that you've been doing inside of us. And so if you've never been baptized, we'd love to do that today. We have a change of clothes waiting for you if you didn't plan on it. If you have said yes to Jesus but didn't come prepared, we have a change of clothes waiting for you. And if you came today ready to make that decision and to go public with your faith, we're going to sing this song. While we sing this song, I'm going to encourage you just to slip out the back and to get changed. We have people out there to help, and then we'll come back in and celebrate your baptism together. So if you want to get baptized, this is your time. Go ahead and stand up, make your way out the back doors, and we'll celebrate your baptism together.